And that is the Gospels to Acts 1-1. That's literally Jesus Christ before he ascends into heaven. It's perfect. Welcome to episode two of Macro Patterns. In this episode, we're going to be going over, at least we're going to be starting to go over Jesus Christ. There's just so much to the name of Jesus in the Bible that it will not be able to be done in one episode. So we'll split it up into multiple episodes. And just to recap, if you haven't watched episode one or if you just need a reminder on episode one, we looked at Father and Son and how the capitalized mentions of Father and Son in the King James Bible appear so perfectly with 70 times 7 mentions in total, which is the equation that Jesus Christ spoke in Matthew 18.22, to just give you an idea of how crazy that is. I challenge you right now to just type in two random words into your Bible search program, and I challenge you to type in two random words to produce this many mentions. Exactly 490, which is 70 times 7. Type in any two words, and what do you think the likely the chances are of getting 70 times 7? The chances are very small. But we're not just talking about God's perfect number of Jesus' perfect equation of complete forgiveness of two random words. We're dealing with the Father and the Son which perfectly go together. It's a natural relationship between father and son. Like It's not even like father and Jesus, or um, it's not God and son, which would also be, I mean, he's the son of God. That would actually fit pretty well. But father and son are the most natural, it's the most natural pair of words you could possibly have. So we have this perfection showing up. And there's only two options. It's either of the mind of God, or it is an anomaly, a random chance, a lottery. One of the most amazing lotteries that's ever happened because this is the most printed book in history. So today we're going to get into Jesus Christ himself. The name above every name. Let's look at the Savior in the King James Bible, Jesus Christ. First of all, I wanted to silence a lot of the critics who I know would pop out behind the rocks or from, from the bushes, and I know that they're going to come and uh, attack me for showing the patterns of Jesus with and without anti-mentions, because there's so many with and without obviously, because we're dealing with Jesus, the name of Jesus. So even if you have somebody named Jesus that's not actually talking about Jesus Christ, it still means Jehovah's salvation. It's still the name above every name. However, we're not going to be looking at any patterns that would feature anti-mentions in this video or in this series. We're only looking at patterns that are talking directly about Jesus Christ. So let's look at the anti-mentions. We will not be including these anti-mentions in any counts. Um, first one is about Joshua. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. So this um, mention of Jesus in Acts 7.45 is when Stephen is talking to the, to the Jews and they then martyr him. But um, during his speech, um, Stephen says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. As he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. So they're talking about he's bringing in that bringing that tabernacle into the land of Canaan, the promised land, with Jesus, with Joshua, and brought the tabernacle with Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles, into the promised land, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So people like sometimes people like to say, well, this is talking about Jesus Christ. And I Jesus was there because he's the angel of the Lord. But I don't believe this is talking directly about Jesus Christ. Historically, 
it just doesn't make much sense that Stephen, talking to Jews that do not believe in Jesus Christ, would use the name of Joshua, or Jesus, same name, and literally in a place where it's talking about Joshua going into the Promised Land, use Joshua's name and be actually talking about Jesus Christ. I uh, Yes, Jesus was there as the angel of the Lord leading them and destroying the enemies, but that's right here where it says, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers. So right here is where Jesus is, Jesus Christ, I should say. This is talking about Joshua. However, Joshua is a big type of Jesus Christ in many different ways, especially uh, for Second Advent. But we're just looking at Jesus Christ, so we're going to be excluding this mention of Jesus because it's talking about Joshua. Historically, Stephen is talking about Joshua when he is talking to the Jews. You can disagree with me if you want, but that's just, I don't think you can refute that with, with logic, with sound logic, and when you're actually just being realistic about, you know, Stephen historically talking to the, about, uh, or talking to those Jews about Joshua slash Jesus, I believe he was talking about Joshua. So, when you just leave the Bible as it is and stop trying to change it to what you want it to be, that's when God will really reveal things to you. That's what I've learned, at least. So, you don't need to force this to be Jesus Christ if it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Joshua. Let it be Joshua. Colossians 4.11, And Jesus, which is called Justice. This is not Jesus Christ. This is a guy named Justice. Okay, moving on. Uh, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, let's talk about Joshua again, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So there remaineth therefore a rest. The true rest is through Jesus Christ. Joshua was not able to give them rest. It says, for if Jesus had given them rest, Joshua um, was not able to give true rest to Israel. It was a temporary rest that did not last, and it was leading up to the true rest of Jesus Christ. But this is talking about Joshua. There's even, um, there's, I think it's an Aramaic, an Aramaic New Testament Hebrews. Uh, it literally says Joshua, son of Nun, in this passage. This is talking about Joshua historically. The church has always seen this as Joshua. I see it as Joshua as well. There's some people that try to say this is Jesus Christ as well. I just don't think the writer of Hebrews was talking about Jesus Christ, the way that this is worded, the way this is structured. I just don't see that as Jesus Christ. That, I believe, is Joshua as well. Again, we leave the Bible as it is, and God will show you amazing things. And I'll, I'll also emphasize again, Joshua was a major type of Jesus Christ. Not only had, did he have his name, but he shared so many attributes. I mean, God listened to Joshua when he Joshua was made. Uh, he said uh, he was telling the sun to stand still and the moon. To, I mean, God listened to Joshua, and it even says there back in the book of Joshua that there was never a time where God had listened to the obeyed basically man. So there's many ways that Jesus and Joshua are just right together. But for the purpose of showing these patterns, for the purpose of not giving uh, any footing to critics who will say that we have you know, too many options that we're looking at and that we can just manipulate anything that we want and show different patterns, we're not going to show any patterns with any three of these anti-mentions. We're just going to exclude them for every single thing you see in this series. So, sorry if I'm talking a little bit fast. I just, I know there's so much coming. It's like a tidal wave of, of information and wonder. To me, at least, when I'm in the middle of this, I feel like I'm in the midst of something way bigger than myself. I don't know how it is for other people, but even with father and son, I just feel like I'm in the midst of something way bigger than myself. This is God's hand at work. So let's go ahead and look at Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. Mention number one of Jesus is the seventh word of Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Now, if you're tuning into this for the first time, this might seem silly at first, but just stick around until we get into the deeper things, because you're going to see how things just keep 
stacking up on top of each other to the point where it's it's ridiculous. Like there's just no way this all happened by by accident. So Jesus is the seventh word of the New Testament, the seventh word of Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, book of the generation of Jesus. Now, if we go to the end of the New Testament, so all the way to Revelation, Revelation 20 to 21, the very last verse of the Bible, Jesus is the seventh word from the end of the Bible, from the end of the New Testament, from the end of the last verse. So if amen is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, Jesus is the seventh word from the end of the New Testament. Now, there are major patterns going on in this verse in so many different ways, but that'll be for a future video because that, that'll be dealing with the first and the last. Um, but for now, we're just looking at Jesus Christ. So, so far we have Jesus, the seventh word of the New Testament, and the seventh word from the end of the New Testament. All right, now let's look at how Jesus shows up and how, where, just how he shows up in accordance to the rest of the volume of the book. So if you look at the book of Numbers, yes, God does have a book called Numbers. Isn't that interesting? God is actually the God of Numbers. People like to say these, these numeric things are just a bunch of, you know, it's just, it's man-made. God made numbers. If, this, if God doesn't have his book perfectly numbered, when everything else that is holy to him is numbered, it should throw you off. Like, why wouldn't God have his own word, his own book, perfectly numbered when he has perfectly numbered everything else that is holy to him in his temple? Just go read about the temple or New Jerusalem or the tabernacle. Everything holy to God is numbered. The book of Numbers plus 777 chapters takes you to Matthew chapter 1, where Jesus first appears. Now, let me repeat that. The book of Numbers plus 777 chapters. I didn't say 543, 681, 255. I didn't give you a random number. I said Jesus first appears 777 chapters after the book of Numbers. Interesting. Also interesting is that if you look at God and Son in the Bible, in the sorry, in the Old Testament, 777 chapters mention both. By the way, you can easily verify that with King James Pure Bible Search. If you simply uncheck the filters and check Old Testament, Type in God and type in Son. So if you look up here in the results, 777 chapters mention God and Son. <clears throat> All right, interesting. So let us zoom back out and go to the next one. Jesus first appears 77% of the way through the Bible. Again, seven is God's number of perfection. This is not a random number we're dealing with. This is not like we're showing you a bunch of like uh, 16s or a bunch of like 122. Like we're not showing you these like random numbers, right? Like these are, this is God's perfect number uh, aligning numerically with himself. Okay, so... Jesus first appears 77% of the way through the Bible by word count. So if you count all the words of the Bible, Jesus is word number 610,288 out of 790,849. If you do the math, that's 77%. Okay, next, Jesus is the 77th from God. 77th generation, which can be found, by the way, in the book of Luke, chapter number 3, it details from Jesus all the way back to God, and if you start with God as number one, you go to Jesus, number 77. Now, um, just a, a note. In the book of Jude, it says um, Enoch is the seventh. So, let's just go there real quick. Book of Jude, 
Oh, wow, that's kind of small. Um, let's see here. Where does it talk about Enoch? So verse 14, Enoch also the seventh from Adam. Right? So he's the seventh from Adam. So Adam would be number one because Enoch was just a man. So Adam one, Seth two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jesus, on the other hand, is the 77th from God, 76th from Adam, which is interesting for several reasons, but um, because he was, when he was resurrected, the, the second Adam, the last Adam, I should say, that's the, he becomes the 77th man, and all the body of Christ becomes that 77th man. But from God, as far as his deity goes, he's the 77th from God. If you count all the, um, the, the generations in the book of Luke. And this is just crazy because um, one of these guys, I'm trying to remember which one it is, but I have it in my notes somewhere. Um, one of these guys is is not mentioned in the genealogy in the Old Testament. And he's just thrown in here, and people literally think that Luke made a mistake when he was writing the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Um, so one of these guys was, was concealed in the Old Testament. And there's many theories on why that happened, but um, a lot of Bible critics will say, well, look, there's an error. Well, I guess it's not an error. Um, not only is it easily explained away by possibly like adoption or something like that, but I mean, we're dealing with the number of perfection, 77th from God to Jesus. Okay, so let's move into how Jesus shows up in the King James Bible. <clears throat> in Acts 1 1, Jesus is the seventh word from the end of Acts 1 1. So Matthew 1 1. The seventh word from the beginning, Acts 1 1, the seventh word from the end. Similar to what we saw with Revelation 20 to 21. This is going to, um, it, it's just so much significance happens here. Um, Jesus ascends in Acts 1 9, I believe it is. Let's, uh, let's verify what I'm saying. I'm not sure if it's Acts 1 9 or Acts 1 10. Uh, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So there goes uh, Jesus into heaven. There is no mentions of Jesus anywhere in the previous verses, except for verse 1 here in Acts. So you can look at a natural division of the Gospels, but you can also naturally see a division of just Jesus' name from Matthew 1.1 to Acts 1.1, because it's just detailing his ministry, life, death, burial, resurrection, post-resurrection on earth, till he ascends up to heaven. So, that you'll see how that um, is important soon. I'm just going to make a mental note of that now, and you'll see how that takes effect. Actually, right now. <laughs> I didn't realize I had it right now. But Okay, so from Matthew 1.1 to Acts 1.1, if you look at all mentions of Jesus, and you look at all mentions of Christ, now, I have the asterisk for Jesus because this is looking at Jesus or Jesus's with the apostrophe. Now, I don't have it on Christ, but I could put it on Christ technically. Uh, but there are no mentions of Christ's, like apostrophe S, yes, in the Gospels. And I can show you that. So if I uncheck, let's clear the search. And if I only check the Gospels, if I type in Jesus, there's 617 mentions. If I type in Jesus with an apostrophe, there's eight mentions. If I type in Christ, there's 60 mentions. If I type in Christ with an apostrophe S, yes, there's zero mentions. So there's no, that, that's the reason I don't have the asterisks, but it is consistent with each other. I just want to show you it's consistent. Now, from Matthew 1.1 to Acts 1.1, there are 7 times 7 times 7, so 343, plus 343 mentions, or 7 times 7 times 7, of Jesus and Christ. And that is the literally the Gospels, uh, to Acts 1-1, that's literally Jesus Christ before he ascends into heaven. It's perfect. 
we saw, so here you can see, so 685 mentions in the Gospels alone, and in Acts 1, 1 would be the 686. So 686 equals 7 times 7 times 7 plus 7 times 7 times 7. We saw how the Father and the Son shows up 7 times 7 times 7 times in the Gospels. And the same thing would apply here. If you were to look from the Gospels to Acts 1, 1, Father and Son show up 7 times 7 times 7 times. So those are in alignment with each other. On top of the other things that we pointed out, like my father mentioned seven times, seven times, and father and God. So, there's, I mean, come on. This is that on top of what's happening. Okay, let's just keep going. There's just too much. In Mark, Luke, and John, so Matthew is a book, a transition book, from the Old Testament to into the New Testament, and is mostly a Jewish book. Mark, Luke, and John, on the other hand, are more towards the Gentiles. And Mark, Luke, and John, if you look at Jesus and Christ, you get 70 times 7 mentions. There we go again with the 70 times 7. Now, this is looking at the singular mentions. I'm going to show you how to get all these results for yourself, so you're not scratching your head. So, for this one, we would just disable um, the um, apostrophe. So let's just remove them. And Mark, Luke, and John. 490 mentions. 70 times 7. So in Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus and Christ show up 70 times 7 times. Now there are other interesting things that you that unify Jesus and Christ and or just make the Mark, Luke, and John an interesting uh, set. Um, for instance, in Mark, Jesus is the 7,778th word of the book. Of Mark, of Luke, and of John, every single one of these books is the 7,778th word of those books, which is uh, pretty interesting and um, very unlikely. The italicized mentions of Jesus and Christ in the King James Bible all fall within these three books. So there are no italicized mentions of Jesus or Christ outside of Mark, Luke, and John. So that's another thing that unifies them all together. They share that in common. So, and there's exactly seven. There's exactly seven italicized mentions of Jesus and Christ. Which technically there shouldn't be seven, but we'll get into that later, and you'll see why. Um, I call those secret mentions. When we get into the secret mentions, you'll understand that it's a miracle in itself that there's seven italicized mentions because they're there should be 10 italicized mentions, but there's seven. You'll see why soon. So Jesus is italicized in Mark 5.24, and I have them all listed out here. The, the middle one, by the way, is Luke 7.37, which is right here, following into this pattern. Okay, so I won't spend too much time there because there's way more interesting things. So the next one is if you look at the keywords of Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So... So it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So if you look up in the Gospels, generation plus Jesus plus Christ plus David plus Abraham, key words of the first verse of the New Testament, you get 777 mentions in the Gospels. I mean, how does that just randomly happen? Okay. If you just look at... Jesus plus David plus Abraham, and this is from Matthew 1 1 to Acts 1 1, 7 times 7 times 7, again, plus 7 times 7 times 7 mentions, matching what we have here with Jesus and Christ. This is dealing with the singular. So, again, so if we just type in Jesus, David, oops, Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, do I have something selected wrong? Oh, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, David, and Abraham. There we go. 685 again. So if you include that uh, uh, that uh, Acts 1 1 mention of Jesus, it makes it 686. 343 plus 343. And I didn't show this one, but real quickly we can look at that. Generation, Jesus Christ, David, Abraham. So we just need to add generation and 
Christ. And then we have in the Gospels, 777 mentions. All right. Next, we have in the historical books, Jesus Christ was Messiah. Messiah means Messiah, which literally is Christ. If you look in the historical books, in the Gospels plus Acts, this is detailing the history of the New Testament, you get 777 mentions. So again, that's easy to verify, and this is when we're going to start removing that anti-mention of Joshua in the book of Acts. So, if we clear these, so Jesus, Christ, and Messiah. So you see it gives us 778 mentions, and one of those is talking about Joshua in Acts 7.45. So the way when we when we have that, here's how we exclude it in King James Pure Bible Search, just so you can see. Um, we, all we need to do is type in like the phrase or even copy and paste it of this mention of Jesus. So if I just copy this and paste it, once I hit exclude, it's going to cross out that mention of Jesus because it recognizes above here we have Jesus and it recognizes that we have a duplicate word here. And when we click exclude, it'll remove this mention from the count, which is pretty cool. So we have a total of 777 mentions of Jesus Christ Messiah in historical books of the New Testament. The rest of the New Testament is no longer historical. It becomes the all epistles and then the, the book of Revelation prophecy. Okay, so we are going to get into the rest of the patterns of Jesus and Christ in the next couple parts, the mountain of evidence that he has provided and that is coming in these episodes is so overwhelming. God bless, and we'll see you in the next video. So recently it was discovered that if you look at all mentions of Joshua in the Bible, including those two mentions of Joshua in the New Testament that read as Jesus, and if you look at all the peer mentions of Jesus, along with all the pure mentions of Lord when referring to Jehovah, there are exactly 7,777 mentions in the entire Bible. So Joshua and Jesus are the same name, and in the King James that's apparent because we have that translation of Joshua as Jesus. Both of these names, which are the same, mean Jehovah's salvation. So it's pretty astonishing that Jehovah's salvation, Joshua, Jesus, combined with Lord, give you exactly 7,777 mentions in the entire Bible. I thought that was worth noting because it seems like intentional. It seems like God purposely put these names in place because Joshua is translated as other words throughout the scriptures like Oshea and Jehoshua and Jeshua. However, his primary name, Joshua, creates this perfect pattern, once again indicating that all of these names are perfectly placed and perfectly given in the exact form that they are. Now, one of the patterns that I showed was how Jesus, Christ, and Messiah in the New Testament historical books, the Gospels and Acts, produced 777 mentions. That was looking at only the singular mentions. If you look at the singular and the possessive of Jesus and Christ alone, and if you turn on case sensitivity, you get exactly 777 mentions of both combined, Jesus and Christ, and you also get 7 times 7 times 7 plus 7 times 7 times 7 mentions of Jesus alone in the historical books. And I also wanted to point out that all mentions of Jesus and Christ and all forms of the word love in the Gospels, gives exactly 777 mentions. The Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. His love was demonstrated to us in those Gospels, which is what makes this so profound. And what's incredible is that if you look in the entire Bible, and you look at Jesus Christ when it's together, and Christ Jesus when it's together, combined with all mentions of love, and you look in the Old and the New Testament text, the verse text, excluding the superscriptions, 
you get 777 mentions. Which, of course, overlaps with all those mentions in the Gospels, where you get 777 with Jesus or Christ. Far exceeding any pattern and any number is the love of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Romans 5, 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I pray that you'll have a good week, and we'll see you in the next video.